before the interstate highway system, before famed Route 66, before highways were even numbered, there was one road that captured the public's attention, one road that led to new horizons, one road that changed America forever. Beginning in Times Square, New York City, and ending in San Francisco, it was America's first coast-to-coast -coast automobile road, the Lincoln Highway. A little over a century ago, there was no single auto road across America. There were wagon trails and ranch paths in the west, turnpikes and farmers lanes in the east, but mostly these roads didn't lead anywhere. The roads of the time, what they were, were just simple paths through the, through the dirt, and these were roads that ranchers and farmers would use to get to town and get back out. At the turn of the century, there weren't that many automobiles for which to build roads, but there were bicycles. Bicyclists actually are the ones that really started the good roads movement because the roads back then, of course, were dirt, which turned to mud, and then when the mud hardened, you had hard ruts, uh, and which is fine for a horse and a buggy, but certainly someone on a bicycle it doesn't work. So when the automobile then became more prevalent, the automobile entrepreneurs who had the financial wherewithal jumped on the bandwagon, and basically they became the, the fathers of the good road movement at that point. Among those early auto entrepreneurs was Carl G. Fisher. Fisher was an Indiana businessman who formed the Presto Light Company, which manufactured acetylene headlights for early automobiles. He was also one of the founders of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, home of the famed Indianapolis 500 race. Carl Fisher, who was really a promoter, really a, a, a grandstander in many ways. He was not a planner, but he had good ideas. In 1912, Fisher conceived a hard-surfaced, improved highway from the Atlantic to the Pacific. He called it the Coast to Coast Rock Highway. In September of that year, Fisher met with automobile industry leaders to pitch his idea and ask for donations to pay for the proposed road. Fisher felt it could be completed in time for the 1915 exposition in San Francisco. Let's build it, he told the group, before we're too old to enjoy it. Within 30 minutes of his speech, Frank Cyberling, president of Goodyear Tires, was so inspired he pledged $300,000. Henry Joy, president of the Packard Motor Company, enthusiastically offered $150,000. The intention was to connect the country from East Coast to West Coast. Commerce was a big piece of it, but also to encourage people to get out and travel. But they also were patriotic and believed it would benefit the country. Within a few months, Fisher had over $4 million in pledges from auto manufacturers and auto-related businesses, all except for one important holdout. Henry Ford was against private enterprise funding roads in America. He thought the government should be responsible. In time, he would prove to be right. The automobile had been around for a couple of decades before the Lincoln Highway, but they were expensive. You'd see Maxwell's and, and uh, Premier's and uh, occasional Studebaker's and uh, other fine automobiles, expensive automobiles that would cost two years wages for a, for a working, working person at that time. And these were playthings of the rich. But in 1908, a vehicle appeared that shook up the nascent auto industry and set the stage for a revolution in personal transportation. That vehicle was the Ford Model T. The Model T was the first automobile mass-produced on moving assembly lines with completely interchangeable parts and marketed to the middle class. It was a rugged and reliable little car that could easily be repaired by its owner. Standing on 30-inch tires, it had good ground clearance 
but its most important attribute was its price. Due to constantly improving mass production, the price of a new Model T dropped from $850 at its introduction to $260 by 1925. With costs coming down, Model T sales shot up. The one millionth Model T was produced in 1915. By 1921, five million of them were on the road, and just three years later, there were 10 million. At the end of its run in 1927, 15 million Model Ts had been manufactured. This singular vehicle propelled Henry Ford to national prominence and the Ford Motor Company to unimagined success. But more importantly, it was the car that put America on the road. People could now journey at their own pace, on their own schedule, to potentially any destination. The only problem was, there still weren't many improved roads. After pledging his company's monetary support, Henry Joy suggested a different name for Fisher's coast-to-coast -coast rock highway. Let's call it the Lincoln Highway. He said that to Carl Fisher, and Carl Fisher instantly knew that was the right name for it because uh, Abraham Lincoln did link the country back together. The Lincoln Highway Association was formed in Detroit on July 1, 1913. It was the first real attempt to develop, map, sign, and promote a road across America. Henry Joy became the association's first president. Carl Fisher was named vice president. Stringing together an assortment of existing roads, the route of the Lincoln Highway was made public on September 14, 1913. It traversed more than 3,300 miles, cutting across 12 states and four time zones. Bonfires and speeches, fireworks and parades occurred in hundreds of cities and towns along the route upon its dedication, October 31, 1913. But now that the road was official, reality set in. After all the promotion, all the anticipation and all the celebrations, the Lincoln Highway was still just an assemblage of existing roads and trails. How difficult would a coast-to-coast -coast auto trip actually be? In July 2013, members of the new Lincoln Highway Association set out to discover the answer. Cars on the tour are wonderful because we have 100 years of cars from 1913, uh, clear up to present day cars. And I love the diversity. The Lincoln Highway was for everybody. You know, when you get out and you, you take the dirt roads, you really see what it was like in 1913 to 1935. And especially, here I'm in a car that was, uh, uh, was around at that time. It's just really, really neat to, uh, to just go back in time and live the way they lived back then. Standing in the sagebrush, battered by the wind. Hey, there it was. I saw it. Drive by that thing again. There's a marker made of concrete from 80 years ago, when this broken blacktop was the country's only road from coast to coast. Down the road, who was the first to think of that? Down the road, long before Jack Kerouac. Down the road, hey, grab your coat and hat. I'll do it, yeah. We're looking for the Lincoln Highway down the road. <laughs> Highway 30 goes through a lot of small towns that don't see the kind of traffic they used to see. They are fabulous, quaint little towns with wonderful people, and you would never get a chance to see them otherwise. The 1916 Lincoln Highway Association Road Guide had advice for those venturing out on the new highway. For a real vacation, nothing beats a camping trip. The guide suggested bringing camping equipment, canned and dry food, and an assortment of rugged clothing. The equipment was essential. They had four or five spare tires, uh, six if they could get them on their car. 
They had tire chains. They used tire chains quite a bit. They had jacks and shovels, poles that they could stick under the bumper to lift up and get them out of the mud hole. They used uh, flat lumber, slabs for put under the tires. Heeding the advice and warnings and purchasing the necessary provisions, early auto enthusiasts packed up their vehicles and began to venture forth on the Lincoln Highway. The Great American Road Trip was born. One such adventurer was Effie Price Gladding. In 1914, she and her husband set out from San Francisco and drove the new Lincoln Highway to New Jersey. Her ensuing book was the first of many to talk about the transcontinental route. We resolved at the outset to take the days and the roads as they came, not looking for luxury and well satisfied with simplicity. It is surprising how one is fortified for the vicissitudes of the road by such a deliberate attitude of mind. Effie Price Gladding. Today, there's a rest stop on the interstate, not far from the original high point of the Lincoln Highway. Here, modern travelers stop to see two memorials that stand high above the freeway. The bronze head of Lincoln was designed and created in 1958 by a University of Wyoming art professor, Robert Russin. Due to the extremes of Wyoming's temperatures, he cast the sculpture in Mexico. It was shipped to Laramie and trucked to its original destination on Sherman Hill, where it was dedicated. Russin said that he wanted to show a contemplative Lincoln in the last years of his life his great heart sorrowing over the rent of his nation. Another memorial at the summit rest stop sits next to that of Lincoln. The Henry B. Joy Monument honors the first president of the Lincoln Highway Association and the president of the Packard Motor Car Company. Joy was an avid outdoorsman who drove cross country multiple times testing the latest production Packards. He often encountered unfavorable conditions, but loved every minute away from the corporate boardroom. His memorial was moved to the rest area from a remote site near Creston, Wyoming, about 100 miles to the west. Where we're standing at right now is the site of the original Henry Joy Monument. The story goes that he was really enamored of the Wyoming sunset and decided that he maybe even wanted to be buried here. In 1939, his wife placed a monument here at this location, and this monument remained here until it got moved to the Lincoln rest stop between Cheyenne and Laramie. Shot a question to the soul of this land Shouldn't all men be free And accept a different crowd Yes, the answer's ringing 